Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to move now, uh, after that very interesting presentation and discussion from the CEO of Nestle, to a panel uh, discussion, conversation with the audience uh, on, the, on the following topic. The state is not enough. Uh, the title seems to reflect a concern that after the meltdown, uh, the state is back in spades. Big government, big brother is upon us uh, and is squeezing out the entrepreneurial spirit. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a session about that quest for balance that uh, Mr. Bulka mentioned. We have a, 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 an absolutely dazzling panel, a dream team uh, of speakers. Uh, we're honored to have um, Madam President of the Swiss Federation, Doris Leutard, with us today. Um, Thank you so much. Please, please. please thank, you. thank you, Mr. Medes. Thank you so much. Oh, yes, not at all, not at all. Take a seat. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. I'll keep standing. Um, mm. <laughs> <laughs> it's the overweight problem right now. <laughs> no taxes. Um, we have uh, also um, Sheikh Lubna bint Khalid al-Kazimi, uh, the foreign trade minister of the United Arab Emirates. Delighted to have you. Thank yeah, you so thank much. You. Thank, you. thank you. So far away. And we also have with us in a very special format um, the symposium's old friend, uh, Madame Minister of Finance of France, Christine Lagarde. She's going to be speaking to us by video. Uh, unfortunately, uh, not in a live format. She had to tape the message, but she very much wanted, wanted to address us. Um, as you can imagine, uh, some European finance ministers have been caught up in deliberations recently. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, maybe the state is not enough, maybe the bailout is not enough, maybe the euro is not enough. Um, but unfortunately, uh, Christine is not able to join us directly. She's flying with her president uh, um, to meetings in Brussels on the question of the Greek crisis. Um, we're going to start with the video from uh, Minister Lagarde and then ask the President and the Minister here for their comments and then open it up to discussion. Madame la Présidente, ma chère Doris, Monsieur le Président, cher Joe, <laughs> Madame la Ministre, cher Sheikha Lubna, Mesdames et Messieurs, chers amis, mes chers amis de saint galen j'ai évidemment beaucoup de regrets de ne pas être parmi vous. At this point in time, most of you think, is she going to carry on in French or do we have to do it? <laughs> um, no, I will not speak French, but I was due to begin in French. I'm very sorry not to be with you. And most of you will appreciate that, given the agenda that we have at the moment, given the turmoil on the markets, uh, my duty as Minister of Economy and Finance for France is to be available for my president, who is currently attending uh, the meeting in Brussels of the heads of states and government of the Eurogroup. And I know that good things will come out of it. So I regret not being with you, especially since you are celebrating um, yet another major event taking place in saint Gall, and you know how much I like being with you. So, you will be debating with two extraordinary ladies on the matter of the state. Is the state relevant? What is the state doing? What has changed? What has happened? And clearly things have changed massively. We are miles, years, decades away from the time when Milton Friedman would have said, more liberty, less government. Well, the motto is entirely different now. It's obvious. And I don't need to go back to the last two years, where clearly the mood has completely changed from times where prime ministers in various places would say, soft regulation, as little as possible. The markets will do the job, 
and they will sort out the boys from the men and the men from the boys. Note, the men <laughs> from the boys. Times have changed. <laughs> and clearly the laughs. states <laughs> were suddenly welcome. When money withdrew, when the interbanking system collapsed, when financial institutions that everybody thought were untouchable suddenly were on the verge of collapse and about to bring all, us, all of us along in the disaster. Times have changed. And the states were called upon to re-inject liquidity, to encourage companies to invest, to substitute companies and to substitute banks. And suddenly, treasury departments were becoming lenders of last resorts, were becoming investors of last resorts. And in a matter of weeks, when everybody thought that states were slow, in a matter of weeks, we had to set up companies, we had to reinvent, we had to reorganize, we had to substitute in the main, and we had to obtain extraordinary powers from our respective governments to just change the course of things, re-establish a bit of confidence that had been completely destroyed as a result of what? Lack of regulation, excess of greeds, excess of liquidity, excess of sophistication, excess in the main, had caused havoc. So states were welcomed. And I will leave it to the pundits to decide whether it was neo-Colbertism or the change of an era of capitalism that is now morphing into something different that needs to be reinvented. At the time, we didn't have much choice. We just had to reinvent and substitute. And we had to transgress along the way. And that was the emergency measures that we had to take. But they were not structural measures that we need to take. Now, was the state enough at the time? It certainly was available and there was nothing else. Now, is the state, are the states going to be empowered to do what it takes to restructure and to reorganize and to bring about this new regulation that will be better regulation as opposed to just more regulation because we all felt gu guilty for not having provided the right regulation and for not having enforced it and for not having been vigilant enough? Clearly, the process is ongoing, and I can tell you for participating in the G20 discussions, both at finance minister's level and at head of state's level as a substitute, clearly, and as an advisor to my president, I can tell you that a lot has been done in the last 18 months. But a lot more needs to be done. And there is very often that sentiment of frustration that not much has been achieved. Look at what the markets are doing. Not much has been achieved because it's a long and tedious process to bring everybody around the table to make sure that there is consensus, that there is agreement, that everybody is going to move along, sometimes forgetting about their own vested interest and their respective competitive advantage on the market. It's tough. It's tough to get people who have relied extensively on their city, on their Wall Street, on giants, to actually change their view, their strategy, and to rely a bit more on other economic forces. And it is sometimes difficult to have the global public interest in mind rather than one's national public interest, let alone specific communities' interests or industrial sectors. And yet it requires that time to build the consensus because we are again in that field reinventing something that is beyond the state and maybe the state is not enough because we need to arrive at that additional level to be invented. The markets have turned global, the financial actors have turned global, the flow of goods and services and capitals have gone global, but market authorities are not yet global. They do communicate, but they're not global. A government is not global because there is no such a thing as a global constituency. And yet, we should all collectively be in charge of the public interest. So what's my message? We've done a lot as a fire brigade. We are working very hard at becoming 
decent architects that are trying to provide the appropriate level of regulations, the good level of regulation, the appropriate level of enforcers around the world, and the adequate system that will enable players to reign their natural instincts that sometimes go very much against the public interest. And I'd like to finish with a, a note with that I'm sure Sheikha Lubna and Doris will understand. I've often wondered whether we would have had a Lemon Brothers if we had had Lemon Sisters. And I often wonder whether... <laughs> 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 and for moving in financial circles and from attending many of those G20s, G7, GX meetings, I can tell you, and I'm sure Sheikh Alubna and Madame La Présidente will agree with me, there are too many dark suits around, not enough legs. <laughs> and yes, we could do with a better mixture. We could do with a bit more parity. Not to say that one is superior to the other, but simply to reflect the diversity of our world, the diversity of our populations, and to make sure that all talents are brought to the table, to make sure that we devise the right rules that will take into account the various skills, qualities and aspirations of the different populations. I would like to finish with a quote, two quotes actually. I'll we, I will use one from uh, President Roosevelt, who once said, a woman is like a tea bag. You only know how strong she is when you put her in hot water. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you that the two women on stage today in front of you, friends of mine that I salute here, belong to that category. They're strong women, they're tough. They know what to do. They know how to say it. They will convince you. And I wish I was with them. Well, I'm, I'm certainly glad that FDR said that and not me. <laughs> I think we've, we've officially retitled uh, the symposium uh, Women as Agents of Change. Madame la Présidente. Well, uh, the floor is yours. Do you, do you wish to make an intervention? Well, I think everything is clear on the table. Yeah. Christine, <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't say it better than Christine did. And I think she, she expressed very well also the feelings in governments and from politicians. Well, for years we had been uh, uh, contacted by business people. Well, uh, actually, politicians, well, do we really need them? Uh, we uh, were, had the feeling, well, they know much better how to do it, how to fix the system. And uh, when we had this crisis, now it totally changed. And now it's really crucial that we don't exaggerate on the other side, that uh, a lot of politicians will think, now, well, we are very important, we have a lot of influence, and we could, with uh, regulation, also put uh, a very, very stronger position of the state of government rules in general, this is not the right way either. I think when you look in the history, you see communist uh, theories, you have capitalist theories, and nothing worked. So what I think still is the best model to uh, combine a largely free economy with uh, regulation is uh, the model of Ludwig Gerhardt from uh, uh, a social economy. And I think this still is working. In Switzerland, we have for years rebuilt on open markets, on an open system, on uh, a low regulatory system, and on partnership with our companies. May it be a startup from St. Gallen or a multinational company like Nestle. The framework conditions are for all the same. They have access to us. Uh, either if they are big or small. And therefore, I think what we really need now is first that all these governments who are involved in the economy, who are entrepreneurs, who run a bank, they create their exit strategies. That's really, 
I think, very important. We are not better entrepreneurs. We are not better uh, bankers. Uh, that's, that's a theory. Second, what in my view is very important, and I think uh, it was also expressed by Christine, we have to rebuild trust. Uh, in uh, our society, citizens, they think, well, we pay the price from this crisis. When you bring now on the table a, a new uh, law or a, an idea to privatize or to uh, uh, liberalize a market, forget about that. The mood in our society is totally against open markets. They would have, like to have more protectionist measures. <coughs> and we have, uh, from the monitoring from uh, WTO, we have since December 2009 an increasing number of protectionist measures. Uh, I think 70% from G20 members. Well, that's, that's a reality. So this but also expresses the feeling that politicians are under pressure, that citizens uh, would like that we begin to rebuild a system of uh, more regulation and m very uh, restrictive regulation. And this would be a real danger uh, to the idea of open economies, of integration, access to markets all over the world. For Switzerland, this is crucial. We are uh, a small country. We depend largely on our export industry. So, therefore, uh, I think this must be kept in mind that we rebuild trust in our societies and here business people have a crucial role. It is not only states who can fix that. Here I think we need also uh, models, uh, entrepreneurs who are real entrepreneurs who uh, don't only have in mind uh, their uh, personal uh, uh, salaries, who really have also the feeling they are part of the society, they, have, they are part of these structures that we can maintain open markets, that we can maintain a liberal worldwide system. And my third point would be, uh, well, Christine told a lot about G20. G20, in my view, they made an excellent work during the crisis to coordinate all these measures. And uh, I, I'm very grateful for that. But we need uh, mu uh, uh, a strong multilateral uh, framework. This must be, at the end of the day, the solution. We now, for years, we tried to integrate a lot of small countries, emerging markets, that they are part of this multilateral system. May it be the World Bank, uh, uh, the IMF, WTO, OECD, all nice organizations we uh, uh, have since the Second World mm -hmm. War. Mm -hmm. And it was the idea that only international rule-based systems give uh, a certain stability, uh, that, that, that they also have a, a legitimacy to control, to monitor the system. And here we have really uh, uh, be careful that they have strong instruments that they have under control this international framework. When G20 have other meetings, okay, but when it's just paperwork, I, it's, it's, it's worth for nothing. We can't, as Switzerland, I think my colleague will tell the same, we can't delegate to the G20 all uh, uh, this international system. Well, we are part of the system. When they talk and they make recommendations, fine by us. But uh, at the end of the day, we need the multilateral system. These organizations have the role to be the decision makers and not uh, a, a number of uh, 20 states all over the world. That's not acceptable. And therefore, also, we have to uh, rethink how we can integrate and rebuild also this political structure of tomorrow. Mm. It's not only the financial structure, in my way, it's also the political structure of tomorrow to integrate uh, a large number of countries and to rebuild a strong multilateral system. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Sheikh Halubna. Mark, um, first of all, good morning to all of you. And before I start, I would like to extend my heartiest congratulations to Sengalen on passing the 40th anniversary. And I think that's a remarkable achievement um, uh, as an institution. Um, this has always been uh, one of my favorite forums because it's the mix of future 
and uh, current uh, uh, structure of people that mobilize the, uh, the discussions and uh, the philosophy uh, in uh, Singalen. Um, my sincere apology to uh, my dearest friend, Christine Lagarde, I'm not showing my legs today. I'm wearing pants, so I fit with the suits uh, rather than fit with the pants. <laughs> um, what I'd like to say, um, what we have seen in the last two years is uh, the fundamentals of capitalism has been shaken to its roots. Um, if you look at any um, uh, earlier incidents or accidents of uh, economic crises, and we've seen this, this is, this is not new. We have seen it with the Enron story earlier, we've seen it with WorldCom, we've seen it with so many, um, either targeting more toward ethics and morals or whether it's actually a, a fundamental state of what capitalism is all about. Um, while a lot of people may say that this is a shift of control, um, um, mobilizing from um, government or states toward uh, entrepreneurs or business people for a long time to free economy, um, and the shift is going back to government to take control, um, I fear these things. I fear the, the thoughts behind these things, because at the end of the day, it is not the states alone, and it's not the business alone. Uh, in my humble belief that if I look back at the last two years, um, I would be someone who may not agree 100% that the regulations were not enough. I think there's plenty of regulation. We've seen it over and over and over. What was not uh, there, what was lacking in my belief, is really more of the checks and balances supervising what's in existence. I think what happened in the last two years, there's been taken, uh, trust has been taken for granted. Someone was checking. Who was checking? Well, someone is checking. No one went back to see who was actually checking. Um, but to come back and say we need more regulation, I think we'll be choking entrepreneurs. We will be choking them to death. Um, we can't put all the blame on the bankers or the banks because like a car, if you don't have petrol <coughs> in existence, whether the car is working or malfunctioning, if the petrol is not there, that car is not going to move. The society, the infrastructure of economy is the car. It's about people spending, it's about wealth creation, and it's about business terms, it's about policies, and that cannot mobilize if the bankers, the fuel is not there. So whether we like it or not, the banks and the bankers are highly needed in good time and in bad time. But the most important part, as Christine Lagarde had said, and uh, my friend, uh, the Madam President, um, you need to put all the constituencies together to think in balance. You can't make a decision on one on the expense of the other. You can't compromise one side than the other. Um, I want to give a good example, uh, as uh, uh, Madam President said. When you look at countries, there are decisions made um, in relationship to the countries themselves, and there are de decision making on the international arena. Both are needed, but the exercise of mobilizing and changing within each unity of an organization, a society, is very, very critical. In the United Arab Emirates, um, a lot of this was felt and hit hard um, mid-2008 moving forward. And the government toward the end, um, I think earlier, and I want to share this as an anecdote because I, I always think of it as an anecdote. Um, uh, Mid-2008, <coughs> most people around the Emirates thought, oh, well, it's not us, this is in the U.S. Or this, you know, this crisis is somewhere else. You know, this complete mm -hmm. denial was sense uh, equally to a lot of societies. Uh, UA was just the same of saying, oh, it's not us. Long behold, two months later, you look and you think, we, my God, we are part of this global economy. We can't afford to have a failing of a country or an economy anywhere else, let alone that if we actually uh, had played as a global player, we had investment worldwide. And our investments be in North America, Europe, or the Far East. It has an impact on, on us. So we have to work together uh, moving forward on that. But internally, uh, injection of liquidity toward supporting and protection of existence of banks was very critical and a crucial state right at the beginning. 
But more importantly, um, and this is the other side, is uh, li like you said, um, it's the trust of the community of the people themselves. For the government of the United Arab Emirates, it was also very critical to support the community was saying, we also protect savings and fixed deposits of people. Um, that in itself could not be in line um, uh, or be, be put separately of uh, just uh, putting liquidity for mobilizing the banks, but also for um, instilling confidence and safety amongst the people themselves. Um, in addition to that, we have seen um, uh, right at the beginning uh, it, uh, of the crisis at an end of 2008, 33 billion US dollars was a, a liquidity injection to the market from the central bank. But a committee was also made by the uh, Ministry of Finance, uh, Central Bank, and uh, uh, Ministry of Economy to put a plan together moving forward. But the other side of the government um, was not just about injection of money or restructuring regulation. The government increased their budget toward uh, focusing more on development of infrastructure. Um, so you sustain a lot of jobs, you sustain a lot of uh, mobilization of the society and the economy itself. So that was critically important uh, uh, to happen at the same time. At the local level, we've seen a lot of money injection as well and mechanisms done at that level. But eventually, um, uh, what we've seen uh, over the years, we, uh, we've just launched a, an HSBC Trade Confidence Index. <coughs> and this for us mattered the most because UAE is a trade hub that sits between East and West. We're the third largest re-export uh, center worldwide. So for us, the mobility of exports and imports, like you said, was very crucial to us. But what we've seen through this, uh, uh, as uh, Madam Minister uh, actually rightly said, uh, the most impact was felt on the trade finance um, related more to companies in terms of trade. Um, that actually had taken a consequential impact, a negative impact. And we do believe that uh, uh, maintaining a confidence amongst the uh, traders was very crucial to us. Um, one of the ways to test this was actually through the HSBC survey that was launched um, actually a few days back, and it's been done twice, uh, um, twice a year, uh, of uh, f uh, 17 countries worldwide by HSBC had done the survey, uh, over 5,100 SMEs. They are the one who impacted the most. Global companies, big corporations, have means and ways of actually finding their finance. Mm -hmm. But it's these companies that get the most impact, uh, employment, and, uh, um, uh, you know, to our delight, UAE scored the highest of 136 marks worldwide. Uh, earlier in, the, uh, uh, in this survey, we've seen ourselves being fourth and then jumped to third. And now um, UAE is actually leading uh, trade confidence index. What does that say? Looking at the numbers, it says uh, <coughs> there's a lot of confidence in the government in terms of putting the right regulation. Um, that was a key area for uh, the government being very um, open about this and, and very transparent. This has an impact on the traders themselves, of feeling the confidence. Other is actually being tied up to emerging markets, and emerging markets, while they grow, uh, there's a lot of dependencies on uh, other markets uh, moving forward. But again, uh, uh, what I want to say at the end of the day, uh, or the, to conclude, is uh, the states would always be involved be it a in liquidity injection, whether it be uh, mobilizing budgets of their own to sustain employment and purchase power, um, be it in a different matter through central bank and other regulation, uh, but alone it will not do it. You do need the other constraints. You need the business people, you need the entrepreneurs, you need the consumers. You need to mobilize consumers back to the spending and to mobilizing um, a lot of their um, a typical um, uh, economic growth because companies like Nestle and others do have uh, a lot of de dependency on consumers. Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you so much. If I may throw out the first question to you. Um, I think there was a, a common thread running through all three sets of, of comments, remarks. Um, and, and that is uh, a bit of a question whether what we're seeing is part of a cyclical phenomenon, deja vu all over again. I mean, we, we all know about the business cycle. In many ways, uh, the vocabulary we're using is remindful of the third way debate 15 or 20 years ago, mm. 
how to find the balance between the state and the market. Is, is that where we are? Or, as e each of you actually hinted in your own ways, is something deeper going on here? Is this, is this different from other cyclical twists mm -hmm. uh, um, of, of market <laughs> capitalism? Um, uh, you, you all talked about trust, which I found very striking. Has bigness failed humankind in some fundamental way? Bigness, whether it's the big state or big corporations, big finance, is that what this is about? Is there a crisis that goes that deep that people no longer know what institutions, public or private, they can trust? And if so, what do we do about it? Are we in a state of denial about how deep the problem is? So is this, is this structural or is this systemic? Is it cyclical or is it something more profound in your view? I think it's more profound. And, and I see two aspects of this uh, problem which is not, can be not be compared to the uh, situation we had at the beginning of the 90s. First, we have a shift of powers. In this period, well, it was the Western, the industrialized mm -hmm. countries, uh, and also after the crisis, the big players have been the United States, the Europeans, and Japan. Mm -hmm. Now you have a shift clearly towards emerging markets. Uh, they are, uh, are, because of the size of their economies, because of uh, the dynamism they have, they put in place in a short period a lot of uh, uh, regulations and a lot of instruments which are Western size and which will allow them to develop with much uh, uh, higher growth rates. Uh, well, they will also have problems they had 20 years before, but uh, they are the new powers. and. It's also a sign on the political side. They are members of G20. Everyone thinks it's okay. They have to be integrated, and they, uh, it's correct that way that they get their right place due to their size of the economy and uh, their importance to the whole system. But we not ha don't have yet uh, also the re responsibility that they take over in international things, maybe in climate change. Here they think, well, yes, we are part of it. Uh, but those who pay, these are the industrialized countries. Come to the World Bank. We had uh, in a week ago the meetings at from the Bretton Woods in Washington. Well, uh, also there. Well, they want to have more uh, shares, want to have uh, more uh, power also in the bodies of these uh, 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 organizations. And uh, when it comes uh, to spendings, when it comes to uh, concrete projects, well, uh, when you raise the problem that are you also uh, um, open to finance all these projects, they still think, well, in 10 years we can talk about that. Look at WTO, that the Doha round is still uh, in the ninth fear of negotiations. This has to do with this shift. United States, well, you are a profound uh, uh, expert in this uh, matter. Well, when they know there's a shift towards China, and uh, until China opens their markets in an adequate way in 10 years, in 15 years, well, uh, this is part of the round which is crucial and with ha which has to do with this power, with this change of power. Singapore uh, at the IMF is still a developing country. Well, I don't know. So I think when we want to have a system for the future, we have to integrate in all solutions this rebuild, uh, uh, to, to, re to rebuild the reality, but also on the financial participation on responsibilities of all these uh, international uh, problems, challenges we have ahead of us. And second, and that's probably a little bit different in uh, the Western world than in the Asian world and um, probably also in the Middle East. I think in our societies, we have, uh, uh, in the last years, uh, we, 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 we try to convince our citizens open markets are uh, good for anybody. Globalization is good for anybody. We profit. We profit from statistics. We can show that, mm -hmm. but people don't feel it. They have the strong feeling only a part of our society really uh, are the winners. We are active. Well, we work harder. We have more competition. Uh, we have to be 
uh, a presence which is every year higher and higher in our company. So they don't really think they have a profit from open markets, from uh, uh, this mm -hmm. uh, well, system we fight it for years now. And I think this is crucial because when they think uh, regulation is better, we have uh, uh, to put in place more taxes made in Coca-Cola or other things. That's not that's not in 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 our in our mm -hmm. sense. That's not good for keeping the momentum of this openness alive. And therefore, I think this has something to do with reliability. This has something to do with long-term commitment. This has something to do also with a philosophy managers have to rebuild. A lot of entrepreneurs uh, are, in my view, not entrepreneurs because they don't have a risk. They are managers, they are employees, but are they really uh, entrepreneurs? Entrepreneurs have a high responsibility. They have a long-term commitment. They have investments also in a long-term perspective. When they really behave and think in uh, that way, I agree. I think we have more employees and not as much entrepreneurs we would need. I shake up a little bit just before. I wonder if I could dwell on this point a second because I, I wonder and and audience reactions will be interesting. Whether what you describe, Madam President, is really a crisis of the West, and and mm. in fact, what we've been seeing is creative destruction on a global scale. Mm. And the shoe is simply on the other foot. It, it doesn't feel as mm. good not to be coming out yeah, on top all the time. In 10 years, it might right. be diverse again. Yes, right. Yeah. I right. Um, I would say, it really, um, it's more of uh, uh, the reason we're seeing the, de the uh, extensive uh, impact of this is w because we are global. Uh, the globalization means that we are uh, much deeper integrated and uh, involved as countries as economies, and therefore uh, the consequence of this is felt much harder. Um, today, if I speak of Nestle, Nestle is not a Swiss company anymore. Um, Nestle sits all over the world with factories. Um, they sustain economy and employment in other countries. Um, they contribute to GDPs of other countries as well through their factories there. So um, uh, it's, not, it's no longer any identity of corporations of company, they're not. Um, bound, you know, they 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 don't have geographical boundaries anymore. So globalization has um, a, a stake when it comes to uh, uh, negative impacts. Today, uh, I see governments uh, should behave more globally. In other words, contribute in their decisions as multilateral as uh, Dora said earlier. Um, there's still this fist fights within WTO and Doha development round. We're still looking there thinking, you know, it's about me and not about the others where there should be more shared uh, multilateral responsibility to say, I'll give, I'll give up a lot of it for longer term because I'm going to gain from others as well. Um, so to me, uh, the problem it really is more of the impact uh, of the depth of globalization we've gone through, um, whether it's in terms of uh, mobilized citizens. Today, we had nomadic employment. People move where the bucks move, uh, where the economy is growing. Um, we see shifts uh, in the business themselves, like you might be a, a Swiss company, but a lot of your major products are actually produced and uh, manufactured somewhere else. We see banks like Deutsche Bank, who today not sitting here thinking, I, I'm a Deutsche Bank, I can only salvage and bail out or work with closely uh, organizations or companies or governments in Europe or in the EU. Um, I'm out there, I'm completely global, I help and pick and choose where I can actually mobilize my business, my, my finance. So um, to me, it, it's more responsibility on all of us to really think on a global level um, where we, we look at solutions, whether it's through IMF or um, w, uh, whether WTO in, in terms of trade or World Bank, we need to sit and think of not ourselves. And uh, um, as Dora said earlier, it's not about um, going inward. It really is about we've moved that far. We can't go back. We have to continue moving forward. But um, it's a point where we stand uh, and uh, rethink what we've done collect and gather uh, our points and mobilize ourselves going forward. It's a fall forward. You can't fall back. On the WTO, is Doha dead? Is there, is there a way forward? How do you see it? 
Well, we, we've talked about this even <laughs> earlier this morning. Um, uh, as long as there are crises taking place, it's really shifting a lot of attention somewhere else. Earlier, two years ago, um, right in 2008, but most uh, prominently we've seen this in 2009, uh, there's so much shifts on finance and banks that people sort of ignored. They sidelined this business of WTO and what's required. WTO is the bloodline of countries. You have traders, uh, you look at agriculture, you look at so many aspects of it. We need to pay attention to that. We need to pay attention to trade finance. But as long as we keep coming back, um, I said earlier over breakfast, I, my, my fear is uh, uh, end of 2009, we thought we reached bottom when it came to crises. We were worried and we we're saying, have we reached bottom? And we're, I had a sense that we did by 2009. But you know, the new problems of Goldman Sachs or crises in a country of bankruptcy um, still gets the jitters for everyone. You know, have we reached bottom? Is there other nasty surprises <laughs> going to come up in a month or so? We don't know. Um, but uh, it, w it takes a collective effort to shift and to move attention toward WTO. Um, my farmers applaud when the Doha round is dead. <laughs> 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 uh, I think to 80% it depends on your president's trade agenda when it comes end of this Best year. Fast track, yeah. we're not. Yeah, so that it gets a new trade promotion authority. I don't know he, if he really dares. And this has, again, something to do with the imbalance between the United States and China. And as long as we can't manage to bridge uh, the gap between the current system and the different system, that the time lag between the change and the open of markets is uh, uh, 10 years, then in my view, it's not doable. We have to reduce and adjust that when we began to negotiate, this was another world than today. So we have probably also there to adjust parts uh, of the uh, well, transition period. That's quite worrisome, of course, because your collect combined message is we need more multilateralism, and yet we seem to have deeper political constraints domestically in key countries. Mm -hmm. So how to move forward, a real collective action problem. Yes, I think, well, as we, st we, we keep in touch on, on Doha all the time, and I think the monitoring system from WTO was very helpful in this regard because, well, uh, ministers and presidents are aware, well, we have to take care, and the protectionist measures could be worse than it is. We also must admit it, well, it was helpful right. to have this transparency and that everybody was aware. Uh, uh, well, uh, this would be also for a period when you have, uh, again, growing growth rates, this would be uh, very uh, negative, and therefore I think uh, we work on that. Uh, it's, again, also at home. Uh, we talked this morning also about government procurement. Well, to convince people at home, politicians, well, let's have access, everybody can, uh, mm. can, can uh, uh, be a competitor. That's not easy. And therefore, here I think, again, it's possible when you have a reliable system, when uh, you have a system which matches all over the world, and then you can convince. You have less discrimination than you have uh, for global companies what they need. Well, they decide on, on other aspects. We have to be better, faster than others, and then you can compete. And at the end of the day, it's the quality of products. It's uh, uh, the decision of the consumer, and mm -hmm. uh, therefore that's uh, the, the idea that uh, at the end of the day you, uh, you, you decide what you buy, you decide what quali which quality, which uh, well, it's, it must be more social or more envir environmentally based. That's the choice of the consumer, and governments are here to put in place this uh, freedom of choice and this uh, access to anybody and to everybody of the system. Good. Why don't we open it up? Um, we have a question right here. All right. Please remember to identify yourself. Thanks. Good morning. Uh, my name is Mustafa Izuddin. I'm a PhD student in international relations at the London School of Economics. Uh, this is a question for Minister uh, Sheikha Lubna. Uh, there is a lingering perception that there is uh, very few, there are very few entrepreneurs, young entrepreneurs coming up from the Arab world, uh, in large part because uh, many of the key businesses are state-owned, family-owned, 
and to the extent it is perceived that the state is a family and the family is the state. Well, first, do you agree with this notion? And second, uh, what do you think the role of the state should be in promoting entrepreneurship and particularly entrepreneurship among young people? Thank you. It's a very good question, but I don't agree. <laughs> um, uh, what I want to um, bring to your attention um, is the development of uh, small medium enterprise SMEs or we call entrepreneurs. And what we've seen over the years is uh, an establishment taking place at the local level of each emirate. Um, and uh, I, we have uh, Mohammed Marash establishment in Dubai. And uh, to my surprise, 50% are women, young interpreters, uh, entrepreneurs. Um, Abu Dhabi has a, a Khalifa fund, um, and we have Rawad in charge, and uh, uh, all the other emirates. Um, a lot of these organizations are actually tr trying to create an environment, a mechanism, and a way of um, nurturing entrepreneurship with young people. Why would you do that? First of all, UAE is a merchant society. Um, this is uh, not from today, but even from the 50s. Um, we, uh, we are across path from uh, East Africa all the way to China on the Silk Road uh, uh, in terms of trade. Um, but like you said, uh, a, lot of, a lot of the traders are actually, um, uh, a lot of merchants uh, are very well established. A lot of big businesses are in place. It's very hard for young people to compete. Um, there are a lot of employment for young people. UAE is a small nation, so there are a lot of encouragement for people to, to take um, parts in a career path. However, um, you rightly said that they, uh, there are a lot of young people who yearn to be entrepreneurs, and it's very important for them to be creative. Um, this has been nurtured at the local level, but from the Ministry of Economy, um, they're also working quite hard on establishment of policies and regulation to support them. But I'll take you in a different path with our ministry. Um, last month, I took 150 SMEs, um, young entrepreneurs from UAE, um, women and men. I took them to the Canton Fair um, for the, uh, uh, the exhibition in uh, Guangdong. They come from different aspects of business specifics, and therefore they stayed at different parts. But they were quite sponsored by the business community. Uh, our job actually to link with the government in China, but also with the exhibition, and take those people on board to have uh, more of an experience of an eye-opener for them, to really see what businesses are out there, what people do. I've taken similar group three years ago um, with 120 SMEs to the Canton Fair. And uh, I remember um, there was uh, one young chap who's working on a form of robotics and uh, got in touch with a company in China that he believes he can involve and evolve uh, more of his technologies uh, in relation to this uh, robotics uh, side. There was a woman, we call her the caviar lady, because she started, <laughs> established a caviar business and quite well known, a young woman, uh, Emirati woman. And uh, I was surprised that I heard her say that she actually connected with uh, some prospects of business in China. So the idea is you create an environment to push them, but entrepreneurs make decisions on their own at the end of the day. Um, but uh, there's much more focus, much more attention. Um, I took them to a major exhibition in, uh, in uh, Malaysia uh, in November last year, uh, 77 of them. Um, so my job in the government side is really to network them, uh, uh, open doors for them, create an environment where they can actually capitalize on. Um, uh, there are a lot of uh, fund organizations, like the ones I mentioned, who actually um, help them out with the creation of uh, policies and uh, uh, mechanism fund, but also help them put their business proposition, their business model, um, and their, you know, their value proposition. Um, but uh, I agree with you that they should be nurtured. They should, you know, government and the whole entity of the study should be responsible to mobilize them and to create growth amongst them. Do we have a question up there? Thank you. Hello. My name is Christoph Friese. Um, I'm currently at Stanford University, but have been an entrepreneur before. I created a company in Germany. We produced uh, machinery to clear landmines worldwide. We manufactured in Germany. We're headquartered in Switzerland. Uh, a lot of our customers were actually governments. And um, 
what I must say is yesterday we talked so much what does the entrepreneur need and what is the entrepreneur. Yes, he takes risk, and, but at the end of the day, he's just a dot in a global economy and he relies on partners. So what he needs is basically financing, he needs customers, and he needs talent to hire. Talent to hire we find here at universities. But now let's talk about customers and financing. Actually, governments are often really, really big customers. State contracts have really high volume. But it's very, very difficult for young companies, for entrepreneurs, to tap into government contracts. To get a contract with the UN, you need to have financial track records of three years. So what I ask you, it's less a question than actually a request, governments need to become better customers. They need to be open for entrepreneurs. They need to basically lower the barrier of entries for new technologies. And um, only through this, actually, the young entrepreneurs can become the agent of change that you want to have. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's actually a very important question. Um, in the UAE, I, I remember specifically the government of Dubai, uh, in order to encourage a lot of the SMEs, uh, they've allocated, a, um, I think, 15 to 30 percent of purchase from government to come from the, in, uh, these young SMEs, uh, which means it opens doors for them to actually capitalize on this. Um, the other side is actually in my past life, and I'll say past life, uh, as a technologist, um, I created a B2B marketplace for the government of Dubai as part of their pr online procurement. And believe it or not, it was one of the uh, um, uh, um, organizations or the mechanism or the, the vehicle to um, uh, bring down a lot of these barriers because at the end of the day, when you go online, uh, a lot of the times... Uh, uh, companies' uh, names are actually not disclosed. All you see is price and qualification. And this helped a great deal um, to do a lot of entry for young companies and to actually compete equally. Um, so I do believe that uh, a change of uh, uh, agent is actually the Internet going online with online procurement helps a great deal. Well, in Switzerland, I think our system of government procurement is quite an open one. I, I don't know if uh, you have a special case, but I don't see a lot of barriers to uh, uh, startups or small and medium-sized companies to have access made beyond the cantonal or on the federal level. But, but, but you don't have special incentives for startups. That's also a, a fact. What I see, which in Switzerland has to be improved, that's the financial situation. We had an assessment or made, and this is also from the World Economic Forum, which uh, makes ra rankings and some uh, assessments. And here in Switzerland, uh, we don't have seed money, like in other states, for startups. And their, their um, availability of venture capital could be increased. It's here, but uh, uh, for a lot of companies who have a development period of five, six, seven years, it's quite crucial to survive these five, six, seven years. So here we ha have some ideas how we can improve. This is really our, uh, uh, something where we also have to perhaps look for incentives for the mm -hmm. private mm -hmm. sector that uh, they are more <coughs> in this sector and help uh, startups uh, uh, in the first years until they really can run a company quite successfully uh, uh, to improve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I, I think the concern you have uh, um, somehow is a legitimate, uh, if you look at the nature of governments as well as the UN, um, the question is really more about uh, um, can we be credible enough to enter uh, procurement uh, competition in less than three years. Um, a lot of the times in uh, uh, state organization, government organization, they don't pay cash immediately. Um, they lie on a lot of credit, sometimes for about a year, sometimes half a year, sometimes uh, um, um, uh, quarterly. So what happens is if you don't have the means and ways of finance for yourself to sustain yourself, um, uh, you can't, a lot of companies can't actually wait till government pays them. And this is very typical of some governments. So it's not, this is not a rule all over, but um, a lot of the times uh, you'll find that uh, a lot of it is uh, payment and uh, large companies can survive to wait, where small companies sometimes can't. So maybe the way is to devise uh, 
um, some mechanism through banks, whether the banks can actually come up with a concept to help with this in order to push more of the entrepreneurs in, in the right direction. Thank you so much. You know, in the, in the 1990s when I was at the U.S. Treasury Department, uh, I was labeled a junior member of the Committee to Save the World. And <laughs> my reaction to the panel today is that I gladly yield my spot to the team of sisters. <laughs> Please join me in thanking them. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.